Welcome to Unfuck Your Brain, the only podcast that teaches you how to use psychology, feminism, and coaching to rewire your brain and get what you want in life. And now here's your host, Harvard Law School grad, feminist rock star, and master coach, Kara Lowenthal. Hello, hello. Welcome. This is a bonus episode of Unfuck Your Brain. I don't do bonus episodes all that often, but as you all are going to start hearing from me soon in 2024, pre-orders are a huge, huge deal when a new book comes out that you want to support. And Vivian Tu has a new book out called Rich AF, and it is a feminist take on personal finance and how women can get over their money mindset socialization that society inflicts on them and really take control of and responsibility for their personal financial health and for building wealth. So you all know that is the kind of thing that we get down with here and that we get behind. And so we are releasing this as a bonus episode because pre-orders and orders the week a book comes out are so, so, so important. So listen to this episode, please listen to this interview. And if you think you might like to read the book, which I definitely recommend you do, order it now because the sooner you order it, the better chance the book has at succeeding. All right, my friends, listen in. Let's go. Hello, my chickens. Welcome. I am here today to talk all about money and women and money and money mindset and all of the kind of stigma and socialization that women get around money. And I have an incredible guest who I'm really excited for this conversation because I can just already tell that we're both feisty in a similar way. (laughs) And I just think it's going to, that's going to make it fun for everyone. (laughs) And my guest today is Vivian Tu, who is a new author. Her book, Rich AF, is coming out very, very soon. And she is also a social media finance star. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, that's my own term I came up with. She didn't call herself that. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about who you are, how you came to write this book, how you came to specialize in this topic in this area. Yeah. Bok, bok. What's up, bitches? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We're starting this strong. So I actually started my career as a Wall Street trader, which nobody believes because I look like I'm 12. Yes, thank you, Botox. (laughs) But I started trading equities at JP Morgan. Basically, equities is a fancy way of saying stocks. So I was trading industrial material and energy stocks and then ended up actually moving over to the risk arbitrage desk, which is like stocks that are going in and out of mergers, acquisitions, spinoffs, spinouts, things like that, just basically undergoing some sort of like change in structure. And I did that for about two and a half years and ended up leaving the industry because I asked myself, do I want to continue to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning in the dark and come home at 7, 8, 9 p.m. at night in the dark and develop a crippling vitamin D deficiency. It's an important question to ask oneself. (laughs) Does any of this sound appealing? (laughs) Does any of this sound good? Yeah, absolutely not. So I ended up leaving for the greener pastures of tech and media. And I was able to get a job in the brand strategy sales department at BuzzFeed. And that is a very fancy way of saying I was an ad slinging slasher. And so I was selling Everything from basic, like the display ads that you see when you go to the BuzzFeed website, all the way to full scale joint business partnerships where we were building out a full new website and hosting IRL pop up events and, you know, creating custom content. And once I ended up getting there, I basically was hounded by all of my new friends, all of my new colleagues being like, Hey, can you like explain finance to me? You come from Wall Street, you got to know what you're doing, right? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, I'll help you rebalance your 401k. You can see which health insurance plan I picked. We'll talk about investments. And it got to the point where so many people were asking the same question that I said, ha ha, I'll put it on the internet. So you guys won't bother me at my desk during the day. And you guys can refer to video seven for investing or video six for budgeting, you know, whatever. I didn't realize that more than just my coworkers wanted this information because the very first video I ended up creating went viral, had 100,000 followers by the end of the week. And since then, I've been doing this roughly two and a half years. 
I've made the Forbes 30 under 30 list, which some people love to call the white collar crime list. Just kidding. Uh, my <laughs> PR team is not going to love me saying that. I have not committed any crimes. I am. You're going to stand out because correct. you will not eventually be convicted of some sort of complicated. Um, finance my team stuff. is definitely going to email you afterwards and be like, you need to cut that. But We're definitely not cutting that. So it's going to be amazing. <laughs> I have been on the Forbes top creators list two years in a row. It's only been around for two years. I've received numerous other awards for teaching financial literacy and just being a content creator. And I'm so proud of that, not because of winning all those awards, but I've been able to help so many people be better with their money. I get DMs all the time saying, I have a Roth IRA because of you. I'm saving for retirement. I asked for a raise. I have a budget because of you. And to feel like I can sit at home in the same sweatpants that I've worn for the past four days and, you know, make an internet video. And in that amount of time, someone can watch that and change their life for the better and feel like they are smarter, more capable, more confident. Like, isn't that the best job in the world? A hundred percent. I mean, I did change my clothes today, but there have been those days. So tell us a little bit. I really want to dig into a lot of the kind of thought patterns women have around money and get into that. But I just would love to hear kind of about now we have an understanding of like what you do in general, but a little bit about the book you have coming out. Like what made you want to write a book, which is like a very different format in some ways. And what made you want to write kind of this book specifically? Yeah. So I create piecemeal content. So there's a video about this, a video about that, real estate, student loan debt, everything. And frankly, it jumps around because my audience cares about different things, right? I've got people in my audience who are 18, about to go to college, want to be smart with their money then. I have people who follow me who are 40 and really starting to think more seriously about retirement, who are at pretty much the peak of their careers trying to think about, hey, how can I really maximize this opportunity now that I'm at a VP level? How do I make more money? And everybody wants different stuff. But the question I would get all the time is like, where do I start if I have no idea what I'm doing? What can I do to better my finances? Like, what is the one, two, three? And I wrote this book as a love letter to everyone who has ever been left behind by the financial system. Because old rich white men have always had financial influencers, financial mentors to look up to. But I know you guys probably can't see this as a podcast, but I don't really fit any of that. Okay. I am young. I'm Asian. I'm a woman. And I certainly never got this education that so many of us desperately need. So I wanted to teach people who have historically been left behind, women, people of color, LGBTQ community, people who grow up low income, immigrants, anybody who has come from a marginalized background where they did not get this passed down to them on a golf course at a country club to learn about money in a really easy way. So you can read it from page one to the very last page and feel ready to take on your financial journey in the same way that like our parents were able to do back in their generation. But I also want to address how it's harder for us now. Things have changed. We live in a very different generation. They played Guitar Hero on tutorial. We are playing it on advanced. And people need to know that. We need to address that. And people need to recognize that no matter where they are right now, they can get out of that hole and they can be good with money. Do you find that your audience skews in any particular direction? Does it tend to be more women, marginalized people in other communities, younger people? Like, does it tend to mimic who you are? Do you feel like that it sort of crosses those boundaries? So like, humble brag, almost 7 million people follow me. So there's quite a few. No need to be humble. We can uh, just just straight up brag. (laughs) This is just a brag brag. Um, Yeah, men don't say humble brag most of the time. Yeah. So there's obviously a huge array of people who follow me. But I would say vast majority fall within the 25 to 44 age category. I'm like so pleased by this, but my audience is 75 to 80% female. And what that tells you is most of my takes are good. And, you know, I think they are a camel hump distribution in terms of income. So I say that being, you know, two major audiences, one being folks who are lower income, looking for budgeting help, saving help, how to make the most of their target shopping trip. What is a hack that can save them money? Then the other audience are people who are high income. They're typically yuppies, young urban professionals. They want to know how to really elevate their career, how to start investing, how to use tax hacks to their benefit, and how to retire in style. And they want different things from me, but they're able to find it in one nice little package that they get a little bit of everything. 
Yeah, that's great. I mean, I'm not surprised that it's disproportionately women because there are, I mean, the financial kind of teaching industry is so heavily male still, heavily older white men who are preaching, like, I think the sort of version of like austerity gospel with sort of like, or they're like completely insane. And it's like, take these $4 and flip it to be a million by Thursday when you buy my course, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So you have this phrase that I love, though, when we got the pitch, I was like, absolutely, that the financial service industry has been male, pale, and stale. So I'm curious, you started working on Wall Street just from being an undergrad, right? And you were a woman of color in a male-dominated industry. What was your experience like? Were you sort of dealing with overt sexism, racism, other forms of kind of micro macroaggression, Or did things feel more kind of like underground? Or did you maybe not experience that? I mean, I shouldn't assume you experienced those things. But what was kind of your experience going into that? You should assume I experienced those things. <laughs> Be I fucking feel like you for probably real. Probably did, but I didn't want to feel yeah. like I was like just putting the words in your mouth. Okay, don't we all love that 1950s advertising slogan? Like genius, right? Pale male and stale. And when I got to Wall Street, I think it was the first time I had felt really other in my environment. Every single person was a white guy except for me and my manager. And they really said, buy one, get one free, because she was also an Asian woman. (laughs) And I think there was always the subtleties of like, oh, I summer in the Hamptons, like you can't afford to do that. There was always the subtle, you know, when my papa worked on Wall Street, like they don't, uh, nobody talks like that. I don't know. I I I love that they all have falsettos. You're like, oh, this is what now we think of Wall Street. (laughs) But, you know, they would talk about how their dads worked in the industry and how they were able to get a job through connections or whatever. And I was like, I don't know anybody here. But there was also times that it was so blatantly overt. When I moved from my first manager, basically the head of my desk got let go. They brought in a new guy. He fired half the teams, brought in his own guy. And he was like, you're going to go work for my BFF, basically his right-hand man. And I started working for this guy. And he would say things like, you're so girly. You're like too girly to be here. He didn't like how, you know, my nails click clacked on the keyboard. He didn't like how I dressed. He didn't like how I looked. And the straw that really broke the camel's back that was like kind of like the red flag of like, you need to get out of here was I came into the office one day with a long cardigan on and he looked at me, touched his hands and bowed and said, is that a kimono? Oh and I'm like, mm, that feels like an HR violation. But uh, <laughs> You're like, this isn't a kimono. It's actually harassment. That's it's actually asking. harassment. <laughs> it's actually a suable offense. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. But like, what was I going to do? I felt like it was David versus Goliath. And I'll be really transparent. I was Remy Ratatouille, Stuart Little snitching on my way out. I told HR everything. They said they were like, oh, I like, you know, I'd like to challenge that. I'd like to like explore that a little bit more. I'm like, explore what? Like, what is there to explore? So I think it made me realize that, you know, to a certain degree that like this behavior was okay. And right. They were not overly concerned. They were not overly concerned. And I was not going to have somebody who had my back. So I had to get the fuck out of there. And that's, I think, a problem with Wall Street right now. They, spend so much money to recruit diverse talent. They have affinity programs for women, for Black, Indigenous, people of color, for the LGBTQ community. They spend so much money to recruit diverse, but then they spend negative money to retain diverse talent. They don't give a fuck about mentoring you or making sure that you know you get the resources you need or that no one is asking you why you're wearing a kimono to work. Right. Like That you're just not being actively harassed, for instance. Right. Like, and so I think that's a big issue that like corporate America faces is that like the recruiting of diverse talent is not the issue. It's the retaining and supporting and mentoring of diverse talent to make sure that they eventually end up in these VP or higher C-suite level roles eventually so that then they, when they look down the ladder and they're able to then help other people who look like them come up, like, It's so hard when you look up and nobody looks like you. Yeah. I was a lawyer before I became a coach. And like the legal field is the same problem. It's like the incoming classes or the recruits are diverse, but then, you know, women start leaving if they decide to have children because it's impossible to maintain that lifestyle or because they're pushed out or, and then like when you get to the professional. Like how many of you actually make partner? Right. Exactly. Right. It's like the partnerships meeting does not look the same as the first year associate meeting in very predictable ways. 
Anyway, we could we could talk about that all night. <laughs> Let's talk about the book and your work and kind of where we intersect with this podcast, which is, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking and teaching and coaching around women's money mindset, right? And it is like so dramatically fucked by the way that society teaches women to talk and think about money. And I see this in, I mean, I coach people on money all the time, but I also mentor, you know, coaches and entrepreneurs who are starting their businesses and like the just complete lack of self-trust that like so many women have around money and money decisions. Like people will tell me numbers that they think tell the story of them being like a completely irresponsible business owner. And I'll be like, this, your business is totally working. You just need to like spend more on leads or what it's like completely, it's totally functional and in fact, pretty successful. But like, it's like not just about the numbers, right? It's like even the way that women see the numbers and trust themselves. That's the main thing I see. I feel like is like such a, just an assumption that, They don't understand money. Whatever they're doing with money is probably wrong. They're irresponsible. So I'm wondering, I mean, you are, I know, sort of more teaching versus like having a lot of back and forth, but kind of how you see kind of gendered socialization around money come up in the work you do. It starts the second you're born, right? Like, Carl, we teach our little girls of like, you know, be responsible, budget for your groceries, don't overspend, don't be a shopaholic. That's the messaging that we as women get that we are overspenders, we're bad with money, we don't know how to do it ourselves. Men get hustle, bro, culture, grow your wealth, invest, start a business. Like, And I'm not saying that's healthy either, but when we talk to different genders about money, one is very focused on scarcity, pinching pennies, trying to save, trying to scrimp and right. save by. It's like someone's going to give you a certain amount and then you just have to make do with that and you have no right. control over how much it is or how to grow it or anything. Exactly. Whereas like on the other hand, like this mentality of like, you can always make more is certainly a better one. But what really, really pisses me off is that it's just not true. Because if you actually look at the stats, more single women own homes in every single state than single men. Women have less debt in every single category with the exception of one, take a guess. That's interesting. I was going to say, I don't know if it's educational or- correct. They have a little bit more student loan debt, but they have less credit card debt. They have less auto loan debt. They have less debt in every category. And Fidelity actually did a study on their, like on a massive subset of thousands of their users and women performed better as investors than men. This one I'd heard that women perform Mm -hmm. better as investors than men. I hadn't heard the ones about debt. Right. So it's like, as with so many things under patriarchy, it's like, you're being told one thing when in fact the reality is completely the other. I mean, the PR team for men. <laughs> for patriarchy. Patriarchy's, for patriarchy, PR is so patriarchy's PR is like the same team that Chris Jenner uses. I don't know for her family. Like they are so good. I don't know what PR team this is, but they are working overtime. Devil works hard, but they work harder. Like yeah. it is all a bluff. The numbers don't lie. Women are in fact better with money. They are the household CEOs. And The only reason we think we're bad at these things is because we're told that, but it's just not true. Yeah. And of course, like if you believe you're bad with money, then you don't trust any of your own decisions. So you're going to be constantly like, I see so much like overwhelm, like people who are not even looking at their math, right? They won't even look at their bank account. They won't look at the business expenses or personal because there's just this thought of like, they're bad, they're wrong, whatever it is, they're doing it wrong. I do, there's that quote, is it Bertrand Russell? It's like, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of a passionate intensity or something. Yes, it's like, that's yes. what it's like. It's like, I don't have to, I mean, a funny thing about the way my professional life has developed is that I just rarely have to interact with men that often in a professional context. <laughs> I mean, I like run my own business. I have my own employees. I obviously would hire men. I don't apply that much. You know, we're an equal opportunity employer. My team's going to freak out. But we happen to be all <laughs> women right now. <laughs> We are an equal opportunity employer, but also just in terms of like, you know, the coaching space is heavily women, the service providers who pitch. Anyway, I just don't have to deal with it that often. But the only time that I could, you know what, it's the finance people. It's like the accountants that are out there that, you know, and I have been pitched by such fucking stupid financial, like just like the sort of aggressive confidence of men who are offering literally no financial value or input or insight whatsoever is like truly astounding to me compared to the like, you know, sort of 
timid self-deprecation of even the women who are pitching me those services. Like, you know, you're trying to pitch me a financial service and you're underselling yourself. And meanwhile, some dude bros are like, we want to charge you 12 grand a month to like give you a spreadsheet or just like some kind of like complete nonsense. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge impact on women's pockets, not even necessarily just from like a business perspective, but of course, like think about this, everybody, if you're driving, don't do this, but like close your eyes and imagine LinkedIn. Okay. You scroll, you're scrolling, you see the perfect job. And of that perfect job in the job description, there's 10 bullet points that they want you to hit, right? How many of those bullet points would you personally feel like you need to hit before you apply? Yeah. They've heard me yell about this all the time. (laughs) Yes. Yes. For women, it's like seven, eight, nine bullets. The listeners of this podcast, it's like 10. Like the perfectionist listeners of this podcast, it is like not only 10, but if I don't have two extra things I can add, I wouldn't apply. Whereas the most mediocre dude who sits next to you, picks his nose at work, is barely getting his job done. He sees that he hits two, three, four max of these bullet points, (laughs) and he is pounding his chest being like, who better than me? I am the best candidate for this. There's no doubt in his mind that he is the best candidate and he is going to do this job better than anyone. And I'm like, damn, like y'all really be singing these lyrics so wrong and so loud at karaoke. Like (laughs) I don't get it, but I feel like a big portion aside from giving people like actionable financial tips is like explaining to them of like how to rewire their thinking and know that they are worth it, that they are just as capable, just as, you know, accomplished. And that, the guy who's getting that job is not better than them. And frankly, I'm not even sitting here trying to like bash guys and be like, they're unqualified. Like we're probably unqualified too as women, but guess what? Somebody's getting the job. It might as well be you. Right. No, I love that. It's like, okay, well, if we're both equally unqualified, you should have as good a chance. Yeah. So, you know, part of what we're talking about is that there's a sort of like, there's a dearth of practical knowledge based on socialization and financial literacy and just like, whatever, living in a hyper-capitalist economy that wants you to spend without thinking. And then there's the mindset piece, which is like you have to even believe you're capable of watching a video and understanding what's happening in it or then like making a decision. But then there's also, we know from the like literature, right, that some of it's internalized. But then there's also, you know, the new study came out earlier this year that showed women actually asking for raises and negotiating as much as men now, but not getting the results, right? So I know that you talk about the stigma around, you know, for women talking about money, basically. And this is, I mean, I came from the social justice world. Like I came from being a reproductive rights litigator at a nonprofit and it being like caring about money meant that you, you know, were you shallow and vacuous and had no, yeah, or didn't have a soul to begin with or whatever. And so, you know, I think what we're talking about applies to people, whether they're employees, entrepreneurs, retired, whatever. But for me, going from that to being an entrepreneur, I obviously had to change my thoughts about money. It's very hard to make money when you believe that. But I'm curious kind of your perspective on how to handle the stigma around women talking about money, which if it's internalized, it holds us back. But it actually also impacts how, you know, the people in the positions of power react to women when they do ask for money or ask for a raise or talk about money. Yeah. I mean, I think if not for you, Do it for your kid. Do it for your mom. Do it for your sister. Do it for your cousin. Because you know what happens when women get money? Nothing bad. Okay. We saw Mackenzie Bezos get half Jeff Bezos's quote unquote fortune. And what did she do with it? She gave it away to so much charity. She is one of the largest now philanthropic donors in the world. When women get money, nothing bad happens. And in fact, when we put money, in women's pockets, guess what happens? We support more women-owned businesses. We end up being able to put ourselves in financially safe and secure situations so that we do not get into relationships with people who financially abuse us. We get to leave jobs with bad managers who don't respect us. We get to provide for all of the people in our community. We basically get to help other people come up because women, I feel like we are wired to be caring, to be caregivers, to be concerned with others. And there is a constant battle of like, is it selfish to want good by myself, to be want good things for me? And the answer is no. There's nothing wrong with wanting more money because you deserve to have that stability. Like you're not going to get more money from your day job and then 
go buy a golden toilet. That's not what's happening. I almost want to say like, and even if you do, right? I mean, I think you're like, allowed to have it. Right. I mean, I think there's like definitely you can see a difference of opinion about whether like women are sort of wired to be more caregiving or that's socialization. But I almost think there's a way in which like the socialization around money is and the socialization around like goodness is so deep for women that like we feel like it's like this can be an effective argument that like women do, you know, there's studies about micro lending or putting more money in women's pockets. They tend to spend more money on education and feeding the family than if the money goes to men. Like, there's the sociological research, but it's almost like a symptom of the whole thing that we feel like we have to like justify it that way, as opposed to sort of like money is like anything else. It's like a tool, right? But like if you do want to buy a golden toilet, then like you have as much right as anybody else to do that, right? Like it's almost like I think a more radical stance to sort of be like, well, money is a resource. And if you want some of that resource, you may want to spend it for the good of everyone else. Yeah. Or you may not, but like that we shouldn't have to sort of justify our sort of desire to have more of this resource that's unequally distributed with like a kind of claim to goodness about it. Does that make sense? I totally agree. And also just like, I think one thing that we as a population typically struggle with is that we think that if we do better, it means someone else does worse. And that's not true. Like when you go and ask your boss for a raise, you are not taking that raise money out of their salary, out of their pocket. Like that's coming from a business banking account that like your corporation has set up for labor costs. Like nobody's being hurt here. Nobody's being harmed. You are not like holding someone at gunpoint to get paid. You are just asking for what you deserve and you are allowed to want nice things. This is life. You only get one shot at it. Yeah. I mean, I think that that the sort of, it's as you're talking about it, I'm just thinking about, I think women are socialized to believe, we're socialized into scarcity in a lot of areas, right? And that, especially, you know, in the last hundred years when, you know, sort of it was like, okay, a few women can go to law school. Okay, a few women can go to medical school. You know, what I'm trying to say is like, when you are socialized to believe that like, only a few of you can make it. Only a few women are smart enough to be taken seriously. Only a few this. Only, right? Like you're sort of already tokenized. Then I think that reinforces this sort of like, well, if I'm getting it, it's being taken from someone else. And that's how women have been treated when they've tried to enter education, business, commerce, right? I mean, there's a that classic story about Ruth Bader Ginsburg being told in law school that she was, you know, what was she doing here? She was taking the seat from a man who needed to support his family. So there's like that sort of history of women being socialized to, you know, sort of like the world belongs and money and professional, whatever belongs to men. And then if we're trying to get some or be part of it, it's like we're taking it away from someone else. You know, it's the same, like, I don't want to say it's like pick me energy, but like, it's similar to always feeling like you have to compete with the girl sitting next to you totally. because it's eat or be eaten. And that's not true. We're better off if we support each other. and. I think that's something that I had to learn in my early 20s, multiple times over. And I was so competitive with other women. And I look back and I'm like, I feel bad for myself. I'm like, you were just really insecure. Like, you don't need to be the special girl for that one boy who like does not give a fuck about you to like, like you, like, you don't need to change who you are. You don't need to compete with other women to be the best because there's room at the top for everybody. Yeah. And if you're working at a place that is engaged in that kind of tokenism where it's like well, only one woman partner, only one woman editor. I mean, I think part of what I love about your story and part of what I try to talk about in my story is like, it's absolutely true that there are like systemic structural forces, but part of the problem, not the only problem, we need social change. But part of the problem is that we're also socialized to believe that like that same scarcity is not enough out there. So it's like, okay, if I ask for a raise and that turns out my boss is a raging sexist who takes that, you know, who holds that against me, now I'm fucked. And it's like, no, now you need to look for a different job, right? You need to like believe in your own capacity and believe in enough options out there to go somewhere else, right? Like one of the, I feel like it's always good information, right? If you are in a situation where you have an employer and you have to like negotiate for a raise, negotiate for a promotion, whatever. It's just like asking someone you're dating to define the relationship. It's like, it's good information either way. You need to know, is that person emotionally available or not? It's not helpful to avoid the conversation so you don't have to know. But it comes from the same thing in work. It's not helpful to avoid asking for a raise because it's possible that the person will hold it against you because of sexism. If that's what's happening, 
let's find out so we can yeah and go. Just go somewhere else yeah. right get a different job make a different plan so i think we're coming you know we're this is coming out right around that sort of end of the year time and listeners are probably thinking about you know kind of new year's resolutions getting how what can they implement what can they do so i'd love to talk a little bit about like what kind of practical obviously people should buy your book and we'll talk about where they can find it in a minute but what are some practical People always ask me this and I'm like, oh, there's so many things. What's like your favorite three concrete actions or tips, whether that's mindset related, action related, whatever that you recommend? If somebody's starting from like, I avoid looking at my bank account, I don't really know what's going on with my money. And I'm like, every time I think about it, I feel a wave of shame and I just stop. Like, what do you recommend that person do? Yeah, I think first and foremost, one of the easiest things every single person can do is get a high yield savings account. And people are like, what what is the gist here? Okay. So when you go put your money in a bank, they're not just holding it for you. That money's getting lent out. Yeah, like this is not a piggy (laughs) bank. Like they are lending that money to other people. And we all know that interest rates right now are like seven something percent. So like they're making a killing on this loan that they're lending. What are you getting for it? A couple pennies. Like your annual percentage yield on a standard savings account, I believe the FDIC national average right now is like 0.42%. It is actually insane. I have all my money, my cash and high yield savings accounts. And it is like, I'm like insulted. My Citibank rep calls me and is like, well, maybe you want to explore some of ours. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what are you talking about? I feel like it's only because people don't know about this that the big banks can get away with this. I'm like, this person will give me $5. You'll give me a penny. And they're like, yeah. Right. So with a high yield savings account, instead of settling for the 0.42%, right now, high yield savings accounts are offering anywhere between 4 to 5% annual percentage yield. So instead of putting $100 in at the end of the year, having $100.42, you put $100 in. At the end of the year, you could have $105. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the more money you put in, those numbers then continue to compound. And like you are making so much more interest. So it's just really important to do that because one, it's less stressful. It's money that, you know, you already had somewhere. It's just going somewhere else. And it's an easy way to have the money that you're not doing anything with. That's just waiting for a purchase in the future or being saved for your emergency fund to do something for you right now. And it only takes 15 minutes to set up. I would say two. Wait, before we get to two, this is the only time I'll ever give a piece of practical advice. You can go to this thing called savebetter.com, which will, if you have more than the FDI insured limit, it's basically a platform that lets you distribute among different high yield savings accounts. So it's also like super simplifies and you can just have each one be up to the insured limit. But seriously, that is like the least go if you have a savings account, please go put it in a high yield (laughs) savings account. It's so easy. Okay. Number two, this is my favorite because it applies to literally everyone. Negotiate every single thing in your life. And people are like, well, Livy, I can't negotiate everything. My listeners are already breaking out in hives just hearing this. (laughs) I know. But we all know that when you go to buy a car or go to buy a house, you can negotiate, right? Like we know that. People know that you can negotiate. People don't realize you can negotiate your medical bills because 80% of medical bills have errors on them. That's not great. I'm not just paying a bill. I'm calling to be like, what was this for? What was this money for? Like, what's, what's wrong with this? You can negotiate your medical bills. You can negotiate when you're shopping. And I'm not just talking like flea markets. Like the other day I was in, I want to say Bloomingdale's and there were this cute little pair of heels. They were suede. And I was like, oh, well, this pair was like the floor model, whatever. There's like a nick in the suede and you can see it. Do you have a fresh pair in the back? And the associate went to the back, checked, and he was like, "Mm -mm, I don't have anything. This is like all we have in your size eight foot. I'm like, okay, great. I was like, Hey, since there's a Nick, I'll buy this pair. Can I get a discount? He cut me a 15% discount on a full priced pair of heels because I complained about this Nick. Had I not said anything, he would have let me pay full price. And I'm talking a department store, a fancy department store. You can negotiate a discount for just about anything. You can negotiate your insurance. You can negotiate your cell phone, Wi-Fi, entertainment bills for all of those streaming services you have on your TV that you probably aren't even using half of. Like you can negotiate everything. You can negotiate services. You can negotiate a travel agent's fee. You can be like, hey, if I book two vacations with you, will you lower your fee? You can negotiate with your wedding planner. You can negotiate 
so many things and it's okay to ask. You are no worse off if they say no than you are right now. And it's not the end of the world to kind of face rejection a couple of times. Like, trust me, I've been handed my own slice of humble pie quite a few times. But once you do it the first few times, it becomes so much less scary. And if you do end up getting a yes, you're saving money, you're better off. And for what? Just because you asked, you took the extra 30 seconds to ask. It's such a ripe opportunity for thought work also. Like all of you listening to this and being like, oh, I'm hyperventilating just thinking about asking someone for a discount, right? That just, whether you do it or not, it's like worth looking at the thoughts that come up and like, what are your thoughts about yourself if you do that? Because people have so many thoughts about the other person thinking they're greedy. They have thoughts about like that they're taking money, right? They have thoughts that it's like low class. Like people have so many fascinating thoughts about this and whether or not you decide to become a lifelong negotiator, do that thought work, like look at what those thoughts are because it's fascinating what's in there. And there's like all sorts of fascinating hidden. I just had a friend text me recently that she realized that like the way she was taught about what was wrong with like bargaining or negotiating was actually like anti-Semitism. Basically it was like that phrase that someone's going to Jew you down oh was gosh, an anti-Semitic yeah. phrase. Right. But like, that's fascinating. Do you want to make your decisions based on the fact that you heard that phrase growing up and that's what you were being taught? Like really look at what's driving like all of you listening to this who are like having nervous breakdowns. It's like it'd be so good for you to set a goal of like, I'm going to ask for five discounts this month and like see what happens. Yes. And I think this is, you know, some of those money mindsets I talk about in Rich AF, my book, is that rich people are entitled because they know the value of their business. And I am not telling people on this podcast to like go to the front of the McDonald's line and be a Karen and like wag your finger at like the poor 20- Nobody's saying to scream at a low-wage teenager. Nobody is saying to yell at the 21-year-old like bagging your fries. But like if you get hit with a late fee, if you have been a great customer, if you always pay on time, you are allowed to call and just ask them to waive it as a one-time courtesy. Right. You don't have to be in the right. I just did this. I had a late fee, but the way Amex does it, it was like somehow a late, it was like two days late turned into hundreds of dollars because there's like interest on the interest on the interest. Right. I just called them. I was like, I put this much money on my card every month. I always pay it off. Like I want this waived. And you have to follow up because I asked for them to waive it and they waived one charge. And then I went back and looked and there was a second charge and I called back. And I was like, you got to wave the second one. Like they're not going out of their way to save you money. You have to advocate yes. for yourself. You have to understand that your business is valuable, whether you are working class, middle class, upper class, it does not matter. Your business has value. It costs them money to replace you with another customer. But that's so and important. They- I feel like we need to like sit with this because this is like a real mindset shift. I think for a lot of women who basically see like asking for something as being like automatically like. They have less power in their, or like they have less power there in someone else's debt as they don't have any like leverage in the situation and they're doing something wrong. Right. But like if you are right, a customer of anything from the store down the street to Verizon, right, your business has value. You are exchanging something of value and you negotiating the terms of that is not a like moral problem. And honestly, you know who likes to negotiate? You know who loves a discount more than anybody? Rich people, I am always asking for discounts on shit because I know I'm like, I bank with you. I have so much money with you. I have my mortgage with you. I'm using all of your services. It would cost you a fortune to lose me as a customer. You will definitely be printing me free checks. The fuck you mean I got to pay for a checkbook? Like, absolutely not. Like, you're going to give this to me for free and you're going to do it with a smile on your face. And they do every single time. They do. Because you know that rich people love discounts. It's okay to do as they do and not as they say in this case. Like you are entitled to get good service. You are entitled to ask for discounts. It doesn't make you cheap. It doesn't make you low class. It makes you savvy. Right. It's like you're not, it's not entitlement to recognize. This is is how women are socialized. Women are socialized to think that acknowledging their own value is being entitled. In like a lot of areas of life. And that is not the case. So can you define what being rich means to you? Let's sort of bring it home since that is kind of what your book is about. Like obviously there's the money, but most people are not living their life just motivated by that. What do you think is like beyond the material comforts? Like what does that mean to you? Being rich and being rich AF is always having the power and the agency of optionality. 
it allows me to choose myself. It allows me to buy my way out of any sort of bad situation, out of anything that doesn't serve me. Because when I had no money, I really thought being rich meant having a dozen designer bags and designer shoes. And now I know being rich means not having to check my bank account to take an Uber instead of the subway at 10 p.m. at night. It means being able to leave a job where my manager doesn't treat me with respect because I have the emergency fund to keep me afloat for the time that it's going to take me to find this new job. It means never, ever, ever, especially as a woman, having to rely on a man out of need. I have a wonderful, loving partner. I want him in my life. I choose to have him be in my life every single day, but I don't need anything from him. I get to make that decision on my own. And I think there's so much power and confidence that comes from being able to have it like that, to be able to talk your big bad talk. Mm -hmm. Because when you know you have the power to do right by yourself and make decisions out of a place of confidence versus a place of desperation, you're going to make better choices. And so being rich truly just means having options and being able to choose the right one for you without money necessarily being the number one and or only factor you're thinking about when making those choices. I feel like that's so important because if you think about like who benefits from the way we're socialized, like who benefits from women being taught that it's greedy to want money, they shouldn't want money, they shouldn't talk about money, they're dependent on other people to decide how much money they get. It's like patriarchy benefits from that. Abusive partners yeah. benefit from that. Yes. Like abusive bosses benefit. Like the yes. system benefits from women being financially dependent on abusive men because they don't believe that they can create and maintain and sustain their own wealth. So good. So where can people find your, your book is everywhere, presumably, but I assume you have a book website or where can people find more? Yes. So my book website is richaf.me. Yes, it's a manifestation. I wanted it to be really fun. I wanted people not to be able to forget richaf.me. You can order the hardcover, the ebook, the audiobook. It's all available. There's even an international edition for folks outside of the US who are in English speaking countries. And you can also find me all over social media as your rich BFF. And I also have a podcast that you can listen to called Net Worth and Chill. <laughs> and I will be on that soon. That is right. right. Thanks so much for coming on. Amazing. Thanks, Cara. If you're loving what you're learning in the podcast, you have got to come check out The Clutch. The Clutch is the podcast community for all things on Fuck Your Brain. It's where you can get individual help applying the concepts to your own life. It's where you can learn new coaching tools not shared on the podcast that will blow your mind even more. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things thought work with other podcast chickens just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your life. I guarantee it. Come join us at www.unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash the clutch. That's unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash the clutch. I can't wait to see you there.